English humour, a scribble in the margins of English language humour. Part 20. British Literary Humour. Of course, not all comedy is spoken or performed even. I've left quite a hiatus behind me of written humour. So I think it's time to fill that gap. I don't personally think that a novel or a play read off a page is a good vehicle for laugh-out-loud comedy. There is, however, plenty of room for irony, understatement, hyperbole, wit, double entendre, and, of course, bawdy, if that's your cup of tea. Well, Chaucer was first out of the blocks with comedy writing in the English, and we've already seen his contribution in the chapter on bawdy. So let's move on to Shakespeare who we've also mentioned, this time in the context of Double Entendre. Shakespeare's comedies are so well known, there's hardly any point in commenting on them. How about his contemporary, Christopher Marlowe, often said to have been Shakespeare, and also the popular playwright of the day? Marlowe was a known atheist, and the unfortunate fellow author Thomas Kidd, one of his associates, was tortured into giving up information about him. He died from his wounds within the year. But Marlowe went swashbuckling on until, as everybody knows, he was stabbed during a drunken brawl in a tavern in Southwark. Or was he? It could have been a dinner party, and it could have been in self-defence, and it could have been ordered by spies, because... Christopher Marlowe was one. Or was he? Our next notable author is also a playwright. It's Ben Jonson, adopted by a bricklayer as a child, fought for the English against the Spanish, wrote plays. The first one to make a splash was Isle of Dogs in 1597, which he wrote together with Thomas Nash. But it made a splash because of its seditious content. The authorities had them all burned, it was never printed, and we don't even know what the sedition was supposed to be. In 1598, the following year, Johnson killed an actor, Gabriel Spencer. He escaped execution by pleading benefit of clergy. Well, I've just read that from an encyclopedia entry, and it shows what summaries can do. He killed an actor, Gabriel Spencer. Well, OK. Yes, in a duel which, according to Johnson's account, was started by Spencer because he knew he had a longer sword. Spencer managed to wound Johnson in the arm, but Johnson struck back and, yes, he killed him. And he did plead benefit of clergy, which was an antiquated law supposed to let men of the cloth off the hook, but later providing a loophole for any criminal that was basically literate. Johnson's most famous satirical play, Volpone, or The Fox, debuted at the Globe in 1606, and The Alchemist four years later. Ben Johnson also invented Father Christmas, and was buried standing up in Westminster Abbey in order to save money. There's a hiatus now, if we remember, while we fight our civil war. Cromwell wins, Puritanism triumphs, the theatres are shut, public singing, dancing and music is prohibited. But in the end, after what's now known as the Interregnum, back came Charles II to restore things to how they were before, that's why it's called the Restoration, remember, and everyone was happy again. We could now watch The Country Wife by Wycherley, the most obscene play in the English language. But then, of all things, the Popish plot of 1678, and a sudden swing towards seriousness. So when the Restoration came back again in the 1690s, it was William Congreve and John Vanborough who were entertaining audiences with a, a Restoration light, which was deliberately targeted at, at a more middle-class audience, and especially with the idea of having women in the audience. The old theme of the battle of the sexes was often played out within a marriage now, rather than with a mistress. And speaking of women, Afra Ben, she was another spy, by the way, very close to the court of Charles II and quite an adventuress, 
a mate of Rochester's. It probably won't surprise you to learn. She was also a bit of a superstar in her day and inspired a generation of women playwrights after her. The general ethos of this whole restoration era is pretty much anything goes. There's no moral judgment. As one critic said, they mock at all restraints. But again, towards the end of the century, the fashion was glum again. The glorious revolution of 1688 hadn't helped. So with our invited monarchs, William and Mary, who really didn't like the theatre at all, sitting on the throne, we could look forward to the founding of the Society for the Reformation of Manners. By the time Congreve presented his Way of the World in 1700 after a five-year absence, the audience's reaction was kind of, oh yeah, that was okay. Henry Fielding was born in 1707, and yet another censorship law, the Theatrical Licensing Act of 1737, is said to be a direct response to his early theatre work. The Golden Rump. That sounds interesting. Well, whatever it was, it led to that law that made any kind of satire on stage virtually impossible to pull off. So off he went to the land of the novel. It's Fielding and Richardson that vie for the possible first English long-form novelist. Well, Richardson was certainly the first, because he wrote Pamela, which Fielding hated so much that he rewrote it as a parody. Shamala. And then came Tom Jones, the history of a foundling, a picaresque romp through all strata of society, and to my mind still, a pretty funny book. Fielding was one of the magistrates that set up the Bow Street Runners, London's first police force. It's 1759 now, and Lawrence Stern, a churchman full of eccentric sermons, writes a short satire in defence of his dean, who was involved in an ecumenical squabble. He wrote a little satire called A Political Romance, which had some success, so he thought, let's try that again. And he wrote a very peculiar masterpiece called Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman, in which Tristram isn't born until the third book. The rest of the novel is a you can't describe it. A rambling pastiche of everything, setting the stall out for Thomas Pynchon and James Joyce in later years. He was only 54 when he died, but he rose from the grave as his body was dug up and sold to anatomists at Cambridge University. Pelham Grenville Woodhouse was born in Guildford at the end of the 19th century, better known by his initials P.G. Woodhouse and the creator of the comic couple Jeeves and Worcester. Bertie Worcester being a hopeless aristocrat, and Jeeves, the sassy butler that always rescues him from his sticky situations. Debate has ever raged as to how much of a Nazi sympathiser Woodhouse was. He denied it, then didn't, then did again. One of his main accusers was a childhood friend of his called A. A. Milne, that's right, the chap that wrote Winnie the Pooh. In Victorian times, Jerome K. Jerome had a lovely honeymoon involving a boat trip. So he swapped the wife for two friends of his, imagined it all again and set them off down the Thames towards London. Three Men in a Boat became a fantastic bestseller and has never been out of print. Neither has Diary of a Nobody by the brothers George and Whedon Grossmith. George previously worked with the Doily Cart Comic Opera Company with Gilbert and Sullivan, and later was a contributor to Punch. Vile Bodies is often cited as one of our funniest novels. Author Evelyn Waugh was the dazzling figure of his age who quickly fell out of fashion. Getting ever more recent, we find the alcoholic Kingsley Amis, who had a great hit with his first novel, Lucky Jim, about an alcoholic. It is, in fact, a very dry and hilarious novel, and not the only one he wrote. The rewards for being sane, he once said, may not be very many, 
but knowing what's funny is one of them. And that's an end of the matter. Anthony Poole, writing around the same time, observed any piece of human behaviour will seem absurd if described precisely enough. And that's what Kingsley did. And so did his son Martin. For comic novels, you'd be looking at money or London fields. But again, I feel like I've missed something out. Because who tells all these oral jokes? Well, they might be improvising. They might have made them up themselves, but they were probably written down at some point. So among comic literature, I'd like to include the joke book. Tommy Cooper's, for example. Tommy was an obsessive joke collector. People would send jokes in to famous comedians and they would pay them a bit of money for the joke. One of them was a lorry driver called Eddie Bayliss, who wrote lots of successful jokes. And Tommy said, why don't you go professional? And he said, I like driving lorries. Cooper also bought jokes from Robert Auburn. Auburn's current comedy was a newsletter full of gags and one-liners. Lenny Bruce used to advertise his shows thus. No Joe Miller, no Corn, no Auburn. Joe Miller was a popular comic actor on the London stage in the early 1700s. But he became a byword for dead jokes, unfortunately. In any case, Tommy Cooper wasn't the only one buying jokes. Of course he wasn't. It was the done thing back then. You could choose from Billy's Magazine, The Comedian, Punchlines, written by Art Paul, Guy's Gags, by Eddie Guy, or Peter Cagney's News Sheet. But the daddy of all joke books was Clayson's Fun Master, a kind of giant encyclopedia of classified gags. It cost Tommy Cooper $900, and that was half price. Ed Sullivan was one of his clients, as were Johnny Carson and Bob Hope. Another Bob was a fanatical joke collector. This was the Englishman Bob Monkhouse, a man described as being middle class, not naturally funny, and pro Thatcher. So a fish out of water, but he worked at it, and in the end got a joke book the like of which has probably never been seen. It was colour coded, it was handwritten, it was organised by subject, and it was stolen in 1995. A very sad tale with a happy ending, because the lure of a reward led to somebody giving it back. The £10,000 reward was paid, and then the police arrested the men. Another old trooper, Ken Dodd, kept a joke book by region. He'd have the jokes that went down best in Liverpool, the jokes that went down best in London, Edinburgh, etc. And I haven't even touched on the 21st century. Are there any funny books this century? That's a bit too modern for me. So let's backpedal. This time, we'll see what comedy we can find in American literature. Mm -hmm. 